Find in the Bible the book of Philippians. And seek diligently for it. For out of it are the issues of life. And several issues of life in the spirit. You hear a little squeaky feedback? That's my hearing aid. It's actually this tooth right here. It's filling does that. All right, are we in Philippians? Good, because we're going to read Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to go down again to verse 5, starting with verse 1. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tender mercies and compassions, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Uh, Shay, do you remember offhand the, la the title of the last two sessions? I don't. We didn't use uh, uh, something like an explanation of Christ crucified, did we? I don't think we did. All right. Well, because we we didn't finish that last time, so we're going to go ahead and finish that. Um, Uh, so what we discussed in the last class and what we need to bring us up to par is in relationship to defining Christ crucified, which we, I think we've done fairly well, um, and defining it in terms of the book of Philippians, not in terms of, um, say, Romans 6 and 7 or whatever. It is particularly uh, used to identify um, this pattern that he wants to explain to the believers. So for Paul, now referring both to the act of Jesus dying on the cross and the, uh, the motivations that took Jesus there, then Christ crucified is, for God, the highest example and is the true explanation of what the Christian experience should be. And, you know, you get that in other books, too. I mean, <clears throat> Paul describes his experience with Jesus as I am crucified with Christ. I mean, how many, how many Christians do you know explain their Christian, their encounter with Jesus as I am crucified with Christ? Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And yet, the man God chose to write most of the New Testament was, I believe, chosen for his accuracy Concerning the heart of God. Concerning the heart of God. <clears throat> and so, um, it's Christ crucified is more than just an example. And we'll explain this example thing here in just a second. But even as an example, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to word it like this. I already did say it like this once before. It is the highest example, but in truth, it is the example that God isn't wanting us to refer to any other example, nor does Paul, throughout his writings in the New Testament, refer to any other incidents or reality as the pinnacle, as the, not again, not just the highest explanation, 
but as the explanation for the Christian experience. And, uh, you know, when he, throughout the New Testament, when he's writing, when he refers to Christ, he doesn't refer to any other experience. He doesn't talk about any other experience. He never mentions Jesus feeding the 5,000. He never mentions not one miracle. He never mentions one incident in the life of Jesus other than the cross. I mean, does that, does that, shouldn't that bear an incredible weight in our understanding of, of uh, the New Testament because if you go to many a church on Sunday in this town or any other town and listen to their sermons, if they refer to Christ at all, <laughs> if they even mention Jesus, um, it will many times be in relationship to something he did in the Gospels other than, than the cross. And yet... The writers of the New Testament didn't do that. They didn't. That, that wasn't the example for them. The, the miracles weren't the example. Again, the Jews knew all about miracles. This wasn't a shock to them. For someone to be of God and miracles come forth was not a shock for them. They weren't, oh my God, like Gentiles do. Oh, oh he must be God because he does miracles, you know. And that must be the important thing because we never saw that before. You never saw it before because you were separated from the living God. They weren't. You know? So when Paul talks about Christ, he brings in the death, burial, and resurrection. Because in that, in that reality, and many times Paul and myself, when, and many that preach this, when we talk about Christ crucified, we're also including death, burial, and resurrection, all of that. And Paul definitely does that. Um, and so, um, uh, but it's more than just the uh, example. It's more than just the highest example. It's more than just the explanation of the Christian experience. Paul sees Christ crucified as the central focus for the definition of God. Now that, I mean, even if you knew that, something in you should go, yeah. <laughs> because, number one, it is the truth. Defining God, don't, you know, come on, let's look, at, let's look at the world, let's look at, then let's look at the religious world. And, I mean, throughout history, everyone is trying to, trying to define God. Well, you know, God is kind and God is, you know, all the things that we would put on God. But in reality, in reality, the cross is the opportunity to comprehend God in his, in his true form. All right, you know, an example the Lord gave me when I was in Bible school, when I was studying this and seeking to know, and he began to refer to Jesus as the Lamb of God to me, and, and it, that reverberated through my being, though I didn't have much understanding of that. And, of course, you know, we can make that just a Jewish subject, but he was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before there was a Jew, before there was a Jewish religion. And, and you begin to see him described that way before, not just a Jew, before a person existed. Before creation, before the foundation of the world, before creation existed, that's what he'd be. I think that, that would be the, you know, while it doesn't sound correct grammatically, it is more correct spiritually. He be lamb. 
And in the and in the book of Revelation, of course, we've mentioned this that there he is spoken of more, way more, not as Jesus, but as the Lamb of God. And and from that. Um, and I asked the Lord, I said, now, Lord, what were you like before eternity? And I think that's a valid question. I, I don't know why more people don't ask it. <laughs> you know, I mean, right? I mean, because if he eternally existed, what was he like? There was nobody to heal. There were no demons to cast out. There wasn't anyone that needed salvation, but he was somebody, or he was just a lump of mud or something that sat there. Do you understand? You're starting to see my point, that, that, that our comprehension of him is primarily in time. We don't know the eternal God. We don't. We know the hand of God. We don't know the being of God. We know, when I say the hand of God, what he can do for us. And that's what we pursue because we're selfish, even in that. We're either selfish or we're really young in the Lord. Because that's understandable for children. Did, did I see your hand? Yes. Yeah, I just also wanted to stretch even further for any creation at all. There was no one worship. Right. It was him. Good. For them. Good. You know, I don't, in all of my seeing of this, I don't know that I ever really picked out that aspect like I have the other. But how wonderful is that? Um, because, and, and here's why. I assume you're saying it for the same reason, but, you know, there are, it, it, uh, you can learn a lot about a church by looking at its name. Um, praise Fellowship. Okay, what do you think they're about? No, healing dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. They're, you know, it's all about praise and worship. And they say, well, this is the highest thing. This is, this is what we want. And yet it's really amazing if you'll go through the New Testament, you, you, don't, you don't even hear a good solid teaching on it. You hear Paul make a reference of admonishing them and teaching them in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But that's way after three chapters in both Ephesians and Colossians of presenting Christ and him crucified. <laughs> I mean, that's a fact, Jack. That's just true. You know, I mean, the reason why many people can't make this leap is honestly, they just can't be real. They can't be real enough to go, you know what? That's exactly right. Somebody says something contrary to their theology and they go, they get all upset and everything. You're trying to steal my toys. Yeah, play with your toys. But, it, but see it if it's true. Look in the Word and at least acknowledge it and say, you know. But we think that we're not responsible for it if we don't acknowledge it. If I acknowledge it and then keep going my way, then I'm in trouble. You know, ignorance is bliss, yeah, until you die. That's right. <laughs> and it ain't so blissful, you know. Because you've spent your whole life hiding from God and hiding from the truth. And, and not just hiding, but there, that is a resistance that, because, and here's why I say that. Because surely God put within every one of us something that would ring true, that if that's the truth, that, I, you know. Now I say that because my experience and many people that I know, something right that have accepted Christ and him crucified as the focus of, of the whole eternal plan of God, many, including myself, something's just, you know, I don't even know how to put it true, just something rang true within my being, but my head had a hard time with it. And, and in my case, not just a little hard time. In my case, I had a big hard time. Okay, because, you know, because to me, they were trying to take away the Jesus that I knew. Does that make sense? Yes. It wasn't evil, but that was the, the Jesus that I knew. If you take that away, I'm starting all over again. 
You know, that's like kind of having a good job and a family, getting a home, getting, a, you know, buying a home, cars, everything. You get TV pretty soon, you know, you've lived life long enough that you're pretty much set. And then the economy goes bad and you get fired and you're, you're jobless. And you have to start all over. That's, that's devastating. Especially when you're older, because you just don't have the zip and vim and big vinegar you know, that you once had. Well, they don't. Some of us do. Yes, did you have your hand? Yeah, I just want to say. The offense of coming into that is <clears throat> being removed from the equation. Yeah. And, oh. and you, once you're removed from the equation and see, if you will, what the equation is, and then finding, finding yourself added into the equation by his by his mercy and his grace and his abounding love, but that you are not the sum of the equation or that you're not, some, well, you're not the center of it or you're not, you're not the subject of it. It's a very offensive for the mind. Well, well put, again. Uh, because the way that Christianity is presented in many churches, notice I didn't say most churches, I've been, I've been in many churches because by nature of the fact that I travel. I have not been in most churches, so I, I can't say that correctly. But I can say in many churches that I have been in, um, the emphasis is really on us more than Jesus. And, and that's not a, trying to condemn anything, but the emphasis is what Jesus has brought to us. We're not only saved, we have power. We not only have power, but what's that scripture that they quote? But we have power to get wealth, and we have we have power over the devil, and we you know, and you know, it it, it borders on being a superhero. Now, I mean, it does, especially in some places. It, it's not bordering. <laughs> I mean, they are. We are the, you know, we are the king's kids. We are the, all this that, that they, they <clears throat> purport to put out. And, and in doing so, uh, who would, I mean, who would want to resist something like that? I, you know, I mean, I mean, really, if you just be honest, especially that superhero thing, I'm telling you. If you, just, if you just look at what's on TV now, and has been for a while, I, it, it, did it start with Heroes, or was it there something before Heroes? Anybody remember the, the show, TV show Heroes? I think it started with that, but, you know, it goes all the way back to Superman and Batman and, you know, all the movies that came out also bef way before that. <clears throat> but now, golly, I mean, you know, we're, we're down to the... The blue thumb or something, you know. <laughs> you know, we've gone through the X-Men, we've gone through, I mean, and uh, in fact, a new one just came out on TV called uh, Alphas, and it's all this superhero stuff. Well, we've got power over the enemy, and you've got power, but we got more power. You know, more love, sort of, more power. More power in my life instead of more of you in my life. And so um, once, you're, once you're enveloped in that culture, because it is a culture, it is, it's a culture. There is no question about it. It is a culture. And once you are um, immersed, is a better word, in that culture, when somebody comes along and, as Shay was saying, tries to take you out of the equation, and worse, by doing it by the cross, not, you know, I mean, if I'm going to go, may the devil send overwhelming forces <laughs> and me standing there for God and being overrun like the Alamo. You know, you know, remember the Alamo. You know, remember Main Street. <laughs> you know, where, you know, um, and so you're, you, you know, that's not your preference, but bless God, if I'm going to have to go out, I'm going to go out like a hero, you know. Well, but for Jesus to take me out, for 
For the cross to be my demise? I thought that's where the devil, no, the devil was never crucified. Well, I thought that's where the devil was saying, well, sin wasn't crucified. You were. You died to sin. You died to sin. Sin didn't die to you. You know. But see, the amazing thing is they never see those scriptures. I mean, they don't see them at all. And the few that sort of see it, it's like it is the most frustrating thing in the world because it's like a... It's like a pinata. You have your blindfold on and you're swinging and you hit it every once in a while. But a whole lot of times you are beating all around that thing. You know, I saw in America's Funniest Home Videos one where this little girl had swung and then she missed and she turned around and she was over beating on the wall and she could feel the wall so she thought that was the pinata. You know, <laughs> we beat all around it. You know, but it's like, when are we going to hit the target? When are we going to hit the nail on the head? You know, it's, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to the, the fair, the old, old days of the fair, they'd had this thing, and they probably still got it out there, and it's a big long tower with a thing that goes up and hits a bell at the top, and you take a big hammer, and if you hit that thing hard enough, it'll go ding, and you'll win a prize. If not, it'll go up, and it has little different colors and different markings, uh, strong man, you know, superhero, you know, really, really good guy, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and then winner, you know. <clears throat> yeah. And, and, uh, it's like, you keep hitting the thing, and it goes, <laughs> down. Hit it again, <laughs> but we never ring the bell. We never really find it to be Christ and him crucified and do so, get this, do so enough to say, I am determined not to know anything among you. What do you mean anything? What about all this great doctrine and teaching? Are you just going to leave that out? No, I'm going to allow it to find its place in Christ as Christ to me. Well, that, they aren't, they've never even heard anything like that. You're, you're from another planet when you talk like that. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like, are you, you know, what are you? Well, um, something rang true inside of us first and rattled our cage, our brain, and our brain and my brain could not wrap itself around the truth as it is in Jesus. It couldn't do it. I mean, I, I was trying to shove it into my brain and it kept going back and shooting back out. I was like, you know, you know, uh, like a little voice in my brain going, does not compute, does not compute, you know, does not compute. But my spirit kept bearing witness. And I said, Lord, Open my eyes, open my heart. And, and folks, there is, you, you have to keep pressing to get past a certain point, you do. If you don't, you're, you're, you'll fall short. Did you have your hand up? No. Um, yes, I was feeling it over here. I was gonna comment on that because I, I've been feeling the same way and it's like with Paul, when that happened to him in the very beginning, like an ax, and it was like, it was hard for Paul to kick against the popes kind of thing. Or like, it was hard for him to do that because it was inside of him. And like, you know, I was, I just told him that, I was like, you can't fake this. I mean, that culture will teach you, that culture that you get in, in that, you can get away with faking it. But in yes. Christ, but in Christ, when Paul said, Lord, Lord, why are you, you know, what's happening here? What's happening? What's going on? Remember when Paul said that? I, I sort of do. And the Lord told him, and that's what was happening right there, is because you can't, you can't. What will be shaken will be shaken, and it has to be him. Yeah, yeah. Or it will be a culture. Right. And right. unless it's going to be, it's going to be Christ coming out of you. And, you know, the best thing to do is just surrender 
to the Holy Spirit, and, and that doesn't, and, and you know, in and, and my heart and mind, when I was confronted with this and didn't fully understand it, I took this stance, and you've heard me say it many times over many years, but this is the road, this was the road I took. I said, like Mary, when told that she was, has Jesus on the inside of her, another life, and that was what God wanted, she pondered those things in her heart, whether they be of God or not. That she was just, you know. And, and pondering means you neither accept nor reject fully. I mean, pondering means you're open, but you're not, you're not an idiot. Does that make sense? You know, meaning you don't just throw the doors open to anything that anybody says. You know, I don't even throw the doors open to anything I say. You know, I, I'd rather just hear from the Holy Spirit, and that's, that's a fact. Um, so, um, this, uh, this reality of the cross actually, you know, sort of removing three and a half years of ministry. And, and Jesus said it was coming. He said... You know, in John 12, 24, just before he went to the cross, just before he went to the cross, he said, except a seed, except a corn of wheat, except a seed fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it'll bring forth much fruit. And you read that and you say, Jesus, are you saying you haven't brought forth any fruit in three and a half years? I mean, you know, if you're going to really read it for what it is, you're going to have to say, if I was standing there, I'd go, now, now wait a minute, Lord, and I'm not questioning you. You know more than I do. But I just would like to ask, are you saying that all of that stuff that you've been doing really hadn't brought forth any fruit? Well, in my understanding, you are the most fruitful dude that's ever walked the earth. And he's going, you know, I've healed people, I've cast demons out of people, I've fed people, I've uh, helped people, um, but they're all exactly the same seed they were when I came. I'm the only one of my kind. That's what he's referring to when he says, unless this, because I'm the only one of it, if I don't die, there ain't going to be any more. I mean, does that make sense? And so he's, you know, so he's going, you know, you, you know, if I had have said that to Jesus, if he talks to me the way he does now, then he would have turned to me and said, um, so, what, so what do you think is fruit? So then you, you think miracles is fruit. Did you do any miracle? Have you ever done a miracle? No, Lord. Uh, would you know how to do a miracle? No, Lord. So even if a miracle happened through you, how would that be fruit out of you? That's fruit. That's my fruit. You see what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and then he would say, those things were all just acts of kindness, if you will, but nothing has been eternally accomplished unless I die and in my death bring them into death and in my resurrection bring them into the same kind that I am. Because if that doesn't happen, there's a good chance every one of them will go back to what they were before. Right? I mean, you know, people get bored after a while. Start looking for new, new fun. A lot of a lot of staunch Christians back in the 70s, when during the charismatic movement, that they were, you know it was massive and the churches were full and they were building big churches and new churches and they were all full and everything and you know and it was all about miracles and healing and that's the truth. It was all about supernatural things and you know uh, you know the first hundred miracles you can get really excited over. But you know, after a while, 
It's, it's kind of like, I mean, my trips, I make a lot of trips, you know, around the world, you know, and, you know, go to Cuba. I'm standing there on the shore, palm trees and beautiful water rolling in, beautiful beaches, and someone comes up and says, isn't this gorgeous? And I said, well, I've seen it before. They're what? You know, yeah, well, it looks I, I, if you had blindfolded me and brought me here, I wouldn't know if I was in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, uh, Jamaica. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, and, I, and so I made a, ster that, that, this actually happened. I made a terrible statement. I said, if you've seen one beach, you've seen them all. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Because, it, it, well, there's sand, there's palm trees, and there's water, and, you know. Uh, the waves aren't big enough for surfing, so nice. Let's go, let's go have some services. <laughs> now, that's me, but, but that's also human nature. It is, because you will get bored. And the example I've used before is, you know, you go get a brand new car guys, you get a brand new car and oh baby, you're out there the first day, you're, you're shining that thing and you're, you know, and you're washing it all the time and you're keeping it, you know, and, and you know, I don't know how long it takes, but let's say a year and three months down the road, you're driving home, the car's all dirty, you drive past the car wash, you, the inside's trashed and da 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 da, and, you know, you, you know, your wife says, well, you, you love that car. Why don't you clean it up? And say, well, I still love the car because it gets me to where I want to go. It's no longer about the shiny color. I'm tired of that. Uh, you know, you say to your wife, if you want to see that same oomph in me again, buy me a new car. Different. Different and different color and everything and more, different bells and whistles. I'll be back the way that I was before, but only because <laughs> it's something new, you know. It's new, it's new, it's new, you know, three months later, it's old, it's old. Well, I thought you loved it. Yeah, I did. You know, it's kind of like marriages in America, nonetheless. The Holy Spirit said, you're going too far, Randy. No, he didn't say that. <clears throat> Um, all right, so there is the, uh, we've, we've referred to two things, the example and the pattern. The cross, and, and this, is, this is important, the cross gives us the example of what Christ crucified looks like. But to be able to live the pattern, notice the two different words, example and pattern. But to live the pattern, you can't live it by seeing the example. You can only live it by the person who was the example living in you. I, I worded it here somewhere I thought it was good. The example shows us the pattern. Amen? The example shows us, well, you don't fully know that one yet, but the example shows us the pattern, but the ability to carry out that pattern only comes by oneness with Christ. And it does. And it does, and it does, and it does. And I just say it's ridiculous to think anything of yourself until you've come to a true God-given revelation of Christ because everything you will think of yourself before a revela the revelation of Christ is will be about you pre-cross. You don't even know how God sees you until you've seen the cross. <laughs> you don't. And, and, and we, you know, what did Paul say? Don't think more highly of yourself than we ought. You remember Paul saying that? <clears throat> well, he would be He'd be right. It was actually a really sweet, gentle way to say. Yeah, yeah, it was. <clears throat> and you know, we know, you know, Barnabas will tell you how sweet Paul was. <laughs> you know, Paul was never afraid to share the, to say the truth, including in front of Peter. Y'all remember that? <laughs> you know, rebuke Peter. In front of everybody and said, this ain't what this is about. And that's where Galatians 2.20 came from, out of that conversation. 
dude, this is about us being dead, you know, not getting along and, you know, uh, not eating certain things or, you know, not offending somebody. I, you know, I got news for you. If you're going to make a stand for Jesus, you're going to offend somebody, you know. What's, what, I, I don't know if I can remember the saying that I was saying, if you don't stand for something, oh yeah, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. <laughs> right? If you don't make a stand for something, well, let's make a stand for the Lord, and then you don't fall for all the stuff that comes down the pipe. All right. Um, so, uh, so we shouldn't assume that the example as demonstrated on Calvary is enough because it's not and Jesus never presented himself or any action as an example to be copied because then it's still us copying Jesus no change, no seed has fallen. You understand when I say no seed has fallen into the ground and died, meaning it would be the same if Jesus just declared everything wonderful without going to the cross, knowing that a seed needs to fall in the ground and die. You know, you, you know, uh, just copying Jesus doesn't change you on the inside. You can copy Jesus and fool some of the people some of the time. Yeah, most people. <laughs> um, but, but, the, but, you know, and the scripture says way more to say about deceiving ourselves than the devil deceiving us. Did you know that? And when I saw that in the word, that that was a true fact, that scared me. It scared me. And I said, Lord, you know, it's bad enough to have a devil that's a master of deceit. <laughs> it's worse that when I'm actually better at it than him. <laughs> Deceiving myself. Uh, uh, don't look at that. No, only think of this. You know. Yes, I'm a really good person. Yes. Don't look at the cross. <clears throat> Because then you'll know you're not. The whole purpose of the cross was to get rid of all the really good persons. That, or at least the people that think they're really good persons. <clears throat> all right. So let me just read this. Since we are the body of Christ, we must live as the embodiment of Christ. All right. Now that, that's, a, that's a really good statement. Because every time we say the body of Christ, that should explode in our understanding that the responsibility then is to live as the embodiment of Christ. Why do I say that? Because there, there has come in that culture we were talking about, there has come the ability to be the body of Christ without embodying Christ. You know. That would be like calling this the body of Randy, but I never live in this body. You know. And if I'm not living in there, folks, it's not a body. It's a corpse. Right? And if Jesus isn't living in his body, guess what it is? It's a corpse. However, it doesn't look that way. And it doesn't smell that way because they really know how to pour on the perfume. And I'm not being critical again, but I'm just saying, if it's not Christ, it's just wrong. <laughs> it's just wrong. Because we are to live as the embodiment of Christ. And if Jesus isn't there, if it's not Jesus' home, I mean, why do we call ourselves a dwelling place of God if God doesn't indwell us? 
Well, that's the cool thing about this culture. We can devise a way that Jesus can live in us without really indwelling us. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, like in my experience growing up and different stuff, it's like there's so much separation. There's like this lack of, of knowing this union and seeing it and, and, that, and, and that, that American self-centered self-focus that refuses to be taken out of the equation. So then we need to make another equation. And in order for that to happen, it's like Jesus gave us some sort of power, like he injected us with some sort of abilities that he has, right. and then he's up on the throne, and now we can do it. Do something for Jesus, because you got his powers. Yeah. And it's like, there's no union. There's no Jesus. Right. Yeah, I mean, it really is like one of the gods enduing us with godly powers, but not be making us gods. If you understand, you know, I mean, I, I, how frustrating is that when, when it proves to not be true. Yeah. You know, it's like you can only distract with whoop, 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 and you know, whatever for so long before you realize, and, and a lot of people are being disillusioned by this, before you realize this is powerless, this is useless. There's powerless. a lot of people being turned away from the church and everything right now because they're realizing that the Christless church, but they don't know that that's what it is. No. This Christless church, it doesn't work. It's failing. It, it, it's, it's useless. There's no life in it. And so they're walking away because they, they haven't been told the truth, and they don't know that it's about him and not them. Amen. All right. There was more in this sentence that I, I was reading. It says, since we are the body of Christ, we must live as the embodiment of Christ. But the Christ that wants to be manifested or the Christ that wants to be able to have us as his embodiment, I'm sorry, is not just Jesus. It's not just Christ. It's not. It's not. And even I thought that for a long time. But it's not some Jesus that walked the shores of Galilee. It is not a duplicate or it is not the same one that, that we relate to for it to be Christ in us. The Christ that wants to be embodied is Christ crucified. Now that's, that's I, I, you know, I don't even expect everybody to understand that or to believe it or to want to embrace it. All I can tell you is unequivocally, I have seen that this is the case on my part and I must reorder my life in even small ways of thinking to make sure that Christ crucified is what I'm determined not to know, not just Christ. And not just say it's Christ in me, and by that, not really have any leaning towards the cross. Just the, a divine person that inhabits me. Are, are you getting that? I mean, even if you don't like it, you know. You know, but I, I would like you to at least understand it. Enough to say, I don't like it. You know. But, uh, but I can tell you personally, believe it or not, I wouldn't stand up here and say this stuff unless God himself had dealt with me for two years constantly and taking me through the scriptures, particularly through, in fact, primarily through the New Testament scriptures and showing all through it and in places that are undeniable um, but over and over in vast numbers and saying, okay, you getting this now? You've been preaching it for 40 years. Are you ever going to get it? <laughs> and he wasn't mad at me in that sense. But I mean, it's, I did, I admit it. I was guilty when I would say to you, it has to be Christ in you. I should have been saying it has to be Christ crucified in you. Because I left a door open for it not to be Christ crucified. And, and I'm guilty. And I never would have done it had I known, but I, I yet need to see the Lord. And yet desire to see the Lord. 
I mean, I, you know, I, I woke up this morning, sat down, and for six hours straight, absolutely, you know, wrote as the Lord dictated to me. Wrote 49 pages in the last two days, but, but six hours of it today, just writing and writing, and him just, okay, bread of life, here you go, there's some more, always breaking that bread. You know, always crushing those grapes to give you wine and imparting and me going, I'm just an idiot. I, you know, today, I'm an idiot. I know nothing yet as I ought. I, you know, I, I'm just um, sad that I'm heading towards the latter years of my life and haven't applied myself more to know him with and when i say applied myself i'm not talking about i should have spent more hours searching the scriptures or i should have spent more hours praying i'm talking about a you know because this is the way david says uh, i applied my heart yes. unto and said uh i'm doing pretty good right now and it's making me lethargic so whether, there's, whether you need to send a crisis is not the issue or not, I need to stir up my heart after you. I need to not get lethargic. I need to not become uh, jaded and, you know, and, and do that so much that the Holy Spirit would consider me his playground, you know, because he loves, you know what I mean, he loves sharing Jesus, that's what he does. So he just, he just runs into that playground and goes, let's go over here and look, here's Jesus over here. And okay, you know, and you're just starting to swing on it a little bit and he goes, come over here now, come over here. And you're just going, slow down, slow down, slow down, really, you know, I mean, this is wonderful, but, but, but he's just going, well, I'm just so glad to have a friend. Because he gets so little of that. You know, it's like, Oh, Holy Spirit, come upon me and change me. You know, and he's just going, you don't mean that. You know? Because if, if I started changing you, you'd start rejecting me. Well, I didn't mean this. I didn't mean the cross. Well, it's not the cross. It's not. It's not the cross. It's Christ crucified. There is no cross for you apart from Christ. So quit trying to, you know, have a cross existence apart from Christ crucified. Yes. And quit try also quit trying to have Christ without the cross. You know, it'd be like worshiping a, 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 a Christless cross. Oh, I worship the cross. Really? Oh, I worship the Christ. But... Paul says, I'm determined not to know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. He didn't say just Christ. Because, 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 because of the wonderful things he does. Because the, the Christ that Paul knows is Christ crucified. All right. Now, whether you receive that or accept that or ever want to or not is between you and God. But my suggestion would be right now or at the end of the class or sometime, just get with the Lord and do it in a sincere way. You know, because I say get with the Lord and we say, okay, Lord, is that the truth or not? Well, there's no openness there. There's no pondering there. You've already made up your mind. So you, you're, you, do you understand what I'm saying? You've already made up your mind. So why do you need a guide and a comforter? You don't need one, you know. Why do you need a physician? Only the sick need a physician. Do you see? And that's what Jesus said to, to the people. Um, just say, Lord, if there's any truth in this, show it to me. But you've got to give him a little length of time because you're hard to deal with. You can't say, show it to me within the next two weeks or I'm going to assume it's wrong. Because I am seeing things this is the truth. I've been seeing things within the last two years that I prayed about 40 years ago. And he said, you know, and it's like, 
it's wonderful. And, I, and he's blessing me with even the remembrance of me asking that and going, now, Lord, I really don't have a clue what this scripture means. And, you know, I mean, I've spent the last two days in verses that I have asked way in the past and, and, and came back after years of seeing Jesus and looked at it again and said, okay, you know, do you understand what I'm doing? You know, I'm looking at those, and I'm going, okay, I think I'm ready now. And still, with everything in me, reading those scriptures couldn't get the truth out of it. I mean, and really meaning it and going, okay, and read it and go, dang it, this, I know this says Jesus, because you know it does, but it's, it's like you squeeze it and you can't get nothing out of it. And then one day he just goes, okay, let's sit down. I'm going to talk about this scripture. And, da, 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 and you go, oh, there it is. And it's all there. And it all makes absolute perfect sense. Right, you know how it works. Right in order. Bum, 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 bum. You go, of course it says that. <laughs> After you see it, you go, well, of course that's what it means. But I knew it meant something of the Lord. But it was one of the most quoted scriptures by the charismatic movement uh, right up there with the, you know, the top 10 charismatic scriptures. And it clearly isn't even in the ballpark of what they were talking about context proves all right sorry and I'm going off on all that how much time we got left well why don't we go ahead and quit and then we'll come back that way it gives us a few minutes to work with here